I guess, or attempt seven. Maybe the audio, the background audio is working. Maybe not. Hopefully it is, and hopefully it doesn't get me taken down. So I've been doing this basically all day because I have nothing else I can do. And what we're basically doing is you're like jumping around on uh, fillpapers.org, grabbing some of these papers from analysis since they are of a manageable length, and reviewing them. Uh, first time I've ever read any of this stuff, and uh, sometimes I know what's going on, sometimes less so, but here we go. So what do we got? Another Benson and A. Let's not do another Benson and A because we already did something by Mr. Nene. Filippo Ferrari. I wonder if he's Italian. <sighs> mm, you have the right variety of uh, Kriegel. Aboutness critical oh, critical notice. Logical structure of kinds. Oh, that's a review again. Ethics and evolutionary theory. Let's take a look at that. Was this a review? Mm, let's see. Uh, well, if I can't download it, I'm not bothering. I'm not going to go to the scientific hub where you can get these things right now. If it's there, I'll do it. If not, what are you going to do? You, me, and the world. You, me. That's why it's roulette. We do not know what we're getting. If you guys have recommendations out there in the uh, wider world, just send them to my, my way. I mean, the only condition is that I'm going to post it as a video review online. So, nothing you don't want uh, associated with your uh, like <laughs> work in product, progress. I don't mind doing a work in progress, but um, you shouldn't... Uh, I mean, if you're worried about getting it published... Uh, and you don't want it, uh, obviously out there with your name on it. It's going to be harder. Mm -hmm. Paradox of analysis. Well, don't feel like doing that. Replacing truth with what? It looks like a review, though. Because of these, uh, non-things. Carolyn Dicey Jennings. Oh, no, no, Ben Stene already did one. Although, Carolyn Dicey Jennings is cool. Um, t -t 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 realism. Ugh. On to twenty fifteen. Vagueness, no. Semantic completeness, no. Incompatibilis, metaphysics, no. Evidence and evidence, evidence of it, evidence. Is it. Shocking. Adverbs, no. Too much language. Frag on subject matter, and I did no. Um, well, I mean, I could go to thought, but it's all the same stuff. I'm just looking for a variety of stuff. Like, if we're going to talk about donkey sentences, the problem is you're going to be sitting there talking about, um, logical, uh, like, analysis and, uh, stuff, and it's just hard. Well, that's really sad when you have to, like, uh, correct a mistake. Let's see what else we got. Ecumenic. Oh, expressive and ecumenicized. Well, that's a cool title, at least. Uh, these are all reviews. Bait and switch philosophy. Most philosophers enjoy uh, employ intellectual division of labor. Philosophy tells us what the truth conditions of various philosophical interesting signs are. Uh, I don't know if I... Hmm... A review. Oh, hey, jerk! I really wasn't expecting to see that. Okay, I think the evolution. I saw the evolution before. I'm betting this is going to be there. Let's see what we got. Come on, come on. Ugh, no download. Why is there no download? Come on, people. Yes. Oh, 
Uh, we're doing what? Evolution of debunking arguments. Ooh, we could do all of these. Let's see. Meaning, medicine, and merit. Racial profile and cumulative justice. Callousness objection. Uh, life years at stake. The brave office. This person publishes quite a bit. Good for them. Look at those good places they publish too. Um, this is a Phil Studies one on something similar. Let's see. Let's click on there. Oh, come on. Boo. Why can't you just give me the paper on your own site? You can. This looks cool with Utilitas. Okay, I went to a, an alternate site and downloaded the file because the hub of science is like the best thing ever, to tell you the truth. So, here's what we're going to do now. Alrighty. Wow, my neck just popped. Okay, so hopefully this will be interesting. We will find out. Evolutionary debunking arguments and the proximate ultimate distinction. You know what? Drink. It appears plausible that human morality is the product of evolution by natural selection. Many believe, in addition, that morality cannot have evolved due to selection for accuracy or reliability. Those elements of our moral psychology that have conferred greater relative fitness have done so independently of truth or falsity of any associated moral beliefs. Um, so we're separating out morality from accuracy or reliability. Okay. In light of this, many philosophers have been led to conclude that natural selection explanations debunk our moral beliefs or do so if moral realism were true. Okay. Moral natural debunk our moral beliefs. Alright. An assumption widely shared by philosophers who put forward debunking argument, it is argument that adaptationist explanations challenge our moral beliefs by showing that facts about right and wrong play no role in explaining why human beings hold the moral beliefs they do. Having argued that normative judgments have evolved for the sake of coordination, Gibbard concludes that we do not need normative facts to explain our making the normative judgments we do. Our making them is to be explained by the rewards of coordination. To suppose that there are normative facts is gratuitous. I mean, things could be multiply realized. I mean, there could be more than one reason why we do stuff. It could be good for coordination, but it could also be right. Now, separating those two out may be difficult, but that does not rule out the moral claim. Similarly, Joyce 2001 claims that natural selection provides an explanation of why humans would tend to employ moral predicates regardless of whether those predicates have empty extensions, non-empty extensions, or if we wish to countenance it, no extensions at all. And Street claims that to explain why human beings tend to make the normative judgments that we do, we do not need to suppose that these judgments are true. Rather, all we need to suppose is that making these normative judgments, rather proto-versions of them, got us to act in the ways that tended to promote reproductive success. Well, you could 
just like true and very productive success are not the only two options there. So again, multiple things could be going into this. I mean, there could be other things besides reproductive success. Success um, judgments are, in some sense, uh, virtuous or some other sort of big word we don't really understand. But we don't actually understand true or reproductive success either, for that matter. So, yeah. These authors believe that if we can explain human moral, yeah. Let me say reproductive success. We don't understand that because just having lots of kids can lead to like. Uh, civilization collapse. It's like this is way more complicated than just saying uh, having successful uh, reproductive rates. So that's, let me qualify it just like, it's not, nothing is so easy to just say this is the goal. Like just reproductive success, full stop. These authors believe that if we can explain human moral beliefs by appeal to truth in different selection pressures, we should infer that moral facts are not needed to explain beliefs of that kind. Maybe not needed, but maybe they are critical. Critics of debunking arguments characteristically grant this assumption and attempt to show that debunking implications need not follow. That's fair. That's probably what I'm saying. By contrast, I will argue that the view that ethical facts are irrelevant in our explanation of moral beliefs if these results from truth in different sections press on a fallacy. Okay. So they're going to say the irrelevance lit rests on a fallacy. Let's find out. I'll begin section 2 by explaining the nature of this fallacy, which relies on confusing different categories of biological explanations. Oh, that's tough. I mean, there's a lot of categories of biological explanations, and so making hard distinctions there is just like, ah, uh, that's reasonably uh, complex. In section 3, I relate the debate on evolutionary debunking arguments to well-known moral explanations debate, arguing that these focus on orthodol, ortho, orthogonal explanatory questions, contrary to what some philosophers believe. Finally, I consider how, how my objections plays out with respect to different particular debunking arguments. I suggest that debunking arguments need not be ruled out wholesale. In particular, it remains possible that Street's Darwinian argument against meta-ethical realism can be reformulated so as to avoid the objection that I outline below. Where debunking arguments go wrong? In his classic discussion of causation in biology, Mayer draws a well-known distinction between proximate and ultimate causes. Proximate causes are causes of a trait that operate within an organism's own lifetime. These might include the immediate triggering causes of, or the developmental factors responsible for its acquisition and expression. Ultimate causes belong to its evolutionary history. An explanation in terms of natural selection or phylo phylogeny is an explanation in terms of ultimate causes. In Mayer's work, the distinction between proximate and ultimate causes is connected to a number of more controversial theses, such as the separation of evolutionary and developmental biology. This separation is increasingly challenged. Leland et al. Leland had a book, because that's probably the book. Um, it's a good book. I mean, you can ignore the philosophy at the end, but the, the beginning of it's just good. Um, nonetheless, the proximate ultimate distinction is widely acknowledged alongside the importance of keeping in mind that proximate and ultimate causes are not competing, but complementary. Natural selection is just one element in a broader explanatory picture in which proximate factors also play their part. Virtually every textbook on animal behavior begins with the instruction that readers keep these points in mind and avoid confusing different levels of explanation. Yeah, very difficult to keep uh, separated, clear, and it's not even clear that there is any of course there's no like hard and fast line between any of these things either so you have to try to make the best distinctions you can but it's not like anything so hard and fast over history I believe that proponents of evolutionary debunking arguments have fallen prey to just this sort of confusion well so does everybody they're not special let's grant that where disposition to adopt certain moral beliefs has been favored by selection, the truth of these beliefs will be irrelevant in explaining why these beliefs were reproductively advantageous. It doesn't follow that the that moral facts play no role in explaining why human so I'm check something. It doesn't follow that moral facts play no role in explaining why human beings have more beliefs of that kind. Moral facts may play a role in explaining these beliefs and 
beliefs in terms of their proximal causes, Nozick, 1981, appears to have seen this point. If ethical behavior increases inclusive fitness, this will explain the spread of such behavior in the population. Yet, each individual's behavior, ancestor, or descent might be explained by hers recognizing certain ethical truths and acting on them. Yes. An, an, an analogy will help reinforce the objection. Imagine that insects in one species, S1, have a certain pattern of coloration that serves as camouflage. It resembles the surrounding foliage. Natural selection has favored this pattern of coloration because it allows the insects to avoid predators. Hello, moths. Suppose the pattern of color coloration arises because juveniles eat a certain kind of moss during a critical developmental period. However, the fact that juveniles have this diet is irrelevant in explaining why having this kind of coloration confirms greater relative fitness. The coloration would be equally advantageous if it came about as a result of different set of developmental factors. Yeah, it's interesting. You could do it approximate, although it could be also a joint evolution, co-evolution of the moss and the animal, uh, the insect. So it may be a long-term thing and not actually so proximal, but that is a nice example. In this case, we can explain why selection favors a certain pattern of coloration in S1, and we can show that the, facts, the fact that members of S1 achieve this coloration by eating moss is irrelevant and explain why that pattern of coloration is advantageous. Nonetheless, it would be silly to assume that we do not need to appeal to facts about diet of diet of juvenile insects in S1 to explain that having coloration the way they do would be absurd to insist that since their colori coloration is explained by the reward of camouflage, a mossy diet is gratuitous as an explanatory factor. It would be similarly outlandish to insist that to explain why S1 insects are colored as they are, we do not need to suppose that they have a special diet during the juvenile stage. All we need to suppose is that having this pattern of coloration has tended to promote reproductive success in ancestral environments. Anyone advancing these claims, however, anyone advancing these claims would be obviously given guilty of confusing proximate and ultimate causes. However, the proponents of evolutionary debunking arguments advance exactly analogous claims with respect to human moral beliefs. They argue that since we do not have to assume that human moral beliefs are true in order to explain why beliefs of that kind have, pro have proven reproductively advantageous, moral facts do not figure in explanation of why human beings hold on belief of that kind. This simply does not follow. Okay, that's a nice analogy, uh, saying that just because, like, the proximal, like, the truth of the moral facts doesn't play a role. It's just saying the moss doesn't actually play a role, but of course it plays a uh, important role in the evolutionary success of the organism. <sighs> yeah, cutesy. Uh, as I said earlier, it could be complicated a little bit more, but, um... That's a re that's a good example. I like that example. It's actually one of my favorite things about philosophy of biology. You get such cool examples. Some of the best uh, exam like coolest examples I think you find in philosophy of biology. The moral explanations debate. Philosophers may be convinced on independent grounds that moral facts do not figure in explanations of human moral beliefs at the proximate level. Harmon. As us to imagine that you see some children pour gasoline on a cat and ignite, whereupon you immediately form the judgment that they are doing what they are doing is wrong. Quote, according to Harmon, the fact that what children is doing is wrong would seem to be totally irrelevant to the explanation of your making the judgment you make. Okay, well, I don't really know what Harmon was thinking. In the ensuing moral explanations debate, many philosophers accept Harmon's claim on this point, many others have rejected it, with Sturgeon in the forefront of those arguing that the wrongness of the action contributes the to the explanation of your judgment. Um, of course, as we were saying in one of the uh, previous uh, ones, the action and the judgment and explanation may not be separate. Like, um, what you actually experience may go into your judgment, so there may be overlap in sort of the action and your explanation in sort of the phenomenal experience of it. So, I mean, it depends on, again, some sort of your phenomenology or your metaphysics of these things to, uh, goes into how clear you think these exa these examples are. Some philosophers, including Joyce 2006, have supposed that evolutionary considerations allow us to reinstate Harmon's challenge. 
However, Harmon's discussion focuses on the proximate causes of human moral beliefs. That is what is at issue in deciding whether the wrongness of burning the cat explains your judgment. Those like Sturgeon, who were already convinced that moral facts are relevant in explaining our moral beliefs at this level, have received no evidence to the contrary in light of the facts about the ultimate causes appealed to in evolutionary debunking arguments. In respect, in that respect, evolutionary concerns do nothing to strengthen the problem posed by Harmon. Um, yeah. So if you already you were if you already believed this, then it's not really going to do anything. There's not a whole lot. Yeah, see, if you're already, yeah, you're not going to be able to, in some sense, if you already believed one way or the other, these arguments might not sway you. Uh, those who are already in agreement with Harmon may not be too worried about, by the issue I've noted, having already decided that the more facts are explanatory relevant, like I said, at the level of proximate cause, they might treat evolutionary accounts as closing off the possibility that these same facts play a role when it comes to the ultimate cause of human moral beliefs. Yeah. I doubt they were especially worried about this possibility in any case. The important point is that those who were not pre previously convinced by Harmon have no reason to change their mind. Yeah. So, let's see. Is there anything, like, super interesting here? No, I mean, it's just, um, in some sense, it pre-defined, like, uh, like, if you've already judged things one way or the other, some of these arguments really won't, uh, sway you. Okay, that's re reasonable. The arguments in detail. We'll now consider how these observations play out in respecting, in respect of a particular in, in respect of particular debunking arguments. Although some arguments are out of the running, I suggest that debunking arguments need not be ruled out wholesale. Nothing ever gets ruled out wholesale. This philosophy, it all comes back to bite you. Occam's razor. Willem of Occam. Let's begin with a clear casualty of my argument. Some claim that evolutionary explanations reveal moral facts with the explanatory superfluous postulates the kind of postulates of the kind we should excise from a parsimonious world view. According to Joyce, once we understand how our moral judgments have evolved, Occam Razor will leave us with no reason to believe in moral facts. Assuming Occam's razor is supposed to rule out explanatory super, superfluous postulates, this argument fails straightforwardly if moral facts explain our beliefs at the proximate level. Sure. So if they are doing work, then why are we getting rid of them? But again, that's something you would have believed ahead of time, and it's not being argued for. In fairness to Joyce, we should note that he does not entirely neglect questions of proximate causation. In light of evidence for the importance of emotional emotion and moral judgment, Joyce 2006 says suggests that proximate mechanisms favored by selection as generating human moral judgments principally involved effective processes. However, this only describes the internal proximate causes of our moral judgments and fails to address whether instantiations of moral properties sometimes act as external proximate causes. Okay, so if it's uh, so you've got some internal cause that's making you do something, but that doesn't mean it's a cause out in the world making you do something. This is the crucial question. So far as I can see, it cannot be answered based on the based on evidence about internal proximate causes, nor based on evidence about internal proximate causes taken in conjunction with evidence about the ultimate causes of human moral judgments. It is a separate question altogether. Yeah. Again, so if you're looking at two different sort of things, one really can't get to the other. But it's putting a lot of weight on the uh, distinction between the proximate and then the ultimate. To be fair, that's the name of the essay, so it's the whole point. Let's move to consider those, yeah, well, it's the whole point, but is that the, the right distinction? I don't know, but it seems like a reasonable one. Let's move on to consider those who argue that our moral beliefs are shown to be insensitive in light of natural selection explanations. So, one sec, let me go back for a sec. Um, did I miss anything about this? Yeah. Yeah. It's like, if you think you can explain stuff by evolution, there's no reason to believe in moral facts, but this only checks some short term, this only checks some of the boxes, not all the boxes. So it depends on which boxes you're looking at. I mean, it depends again how you slice up the boxes. 
Let's move on to consider those who argue that our moral beliefs are shown to be insensitive in light of natural selection explanations. Roos, 1986, tells me, you would believe what you do about right and wrong irrespective of whether or not a true right and wrong existed. Yeah, sure, probably. Given two worlds identical except that one has objective morality and the other does not, the humans therein would think and act in the exact same ways. I don't know, maybe, but... I don't know if I buy any of this. That seems a little, uh... Oh well. If we suppose that moral facts play a critical explanatory role in bringing about our moral beliefs at the proximate level, it seems implausible that were there no such facts, we would have the very same moral beliefs. I know. Like, if they did play a role, then why would we end up in the same spot? By analogy, if there were no mosty while mosty during the juvenile age, it seems implausible that S1 insects would develop the very same camouflage coloration since the development of this trait depends on the, on diet. Again, like I said earlier, it could actually have been a case of like mutual evolution of these things um, growing together and not just some sort of random proximate cause that happened to work right now. So it could be a very long thing, but that doesn't hurt the argument in this area here. That's still, it still could happen as the author says, and all of this could just work as they say. Bruce could reply that I'm overlooking the issue of functional equivalence, the ability of natural selection to achieve the same result via different proximate mechanisms. Sure. Bruce might insist that if there were no moral facts, selection could find a different means by which to bring about human moral beliefs. After all, these beliefs would be equally advantageous, but that's an ad hoc argument. It could happen all alternately, but there's no reason to assume things would all play out the same way, except uh, if you want to call it ad hoc. Now, does that cut both ways? Sure, but then again, we're back to the position, either you believe it to begin with or you, believe, you don't believe it to begin with. Yeah, and then that's where we get to. However, the fact that this could in principle occur fails to show that it would occur. The same argument is now available to a different objection. Sensitivity must be relativized to methods if it is to constitute an important epistemic good. Seeing him alive and well, the grandmother knows her grandson is healthy. Even if she knows that her family would tell her he was healthy even if he was sick, and also that she would believe them, she knows he is not sick because she can see very well that he is well. What matters is whether one would believe P using the very same method if P were false. In a world without moral facts, we might have the same moral beliefs, but if we actually form more moral beliefs by responding to moral properties, we would achieve the same beliefs only as a result of forming our moral beliefs in a different way. But what that ma what matters is sensitivity relativized to methods, no skeptical implications follow from this. Well, the question is, what if we ended up in the exact same way without the objective moral beliefs, what actually would that have been? I mean, would, is it just a semantics problem where we just call the other thing this is the moral beliefs? And then if the world was set up that evolution was to create these evolutionary beliefs and then it happened a different way, then it's just saying there's multiple ways of generating moral beliefs, but that wouldn't even... That wouldn't actually be an objection because you'd still it'd be an objective fact about evolution that it always makes these things, and it might not make. And the reason it makes them ha may have nothing to do with the evolution of it. It's like that's a function of evolution from the top, not part of the like struggle for selection that happened to be just sort of a, um, a historical accident. But that again require a lot of arguing one way or the other, and it wouldn't uh, be so clear. Someone might object that we could. Someone might object that we could, in fact, have used the very same method to arrive at the very same moral beliefs, and had there been no moral facts, even if the beliefs we actually form arise in response to moral properties. Just because our beliefs do not arise in response to the same external facts does not show that a different method must be involved. Could have been dumb luck, sure. Thus, many philosophers are inclined to count a case of veridical perception as, and an internally indistinguishable case of hallucination as involving the same method of belief formation. Okay, the multiple, multiple realizability. Even if we set aside the objections raised against this way of individuating methods by philosophers, including Williamson 2000, my objection stands. The question is not whether we could, in principle, have achieved the same moral beliefs using the same method, but whether we would have done so. Well, it would have been dumb luck. Um... The cognitive machinery on which our moral beliefs rely is genuinely responsive to moral properties. If the cognitive, yeah, that's a, it's a big if. 
if the cognitive machinery on which our moral beliefs rely is genuinely responsible to moral properties, it seems implausible that the same internal mechanism would produce the same beliefs in the same way where there are no moral facts, even if this possible, it is possible in some sense. Yeah, I mean, it's, but this is a uh, fine-tuning argument. Why is why are we so fine-tuned in this way? I don't really like fine-tuning arguments, but again, the point stands that fine-tuning doesn't actually uh, rule out one way or the other what's going on. It just says we don't know why we are this way. It just happened that way. So there's no reason to um, assume one way or the other what is actually going on. Is there moral belief? Are there moral facts or not moral facts? These sorts of things can't tell you. Similarly, perhaps we could have, in principle, have experienced a sequence of hallucinations internally indistinguishable from the vertical experience of that we have cats if there had been no cats, but that's not really what happened in the nearest felineless world. See, I don't, like, there's no, I don't really like this argument. Like, we don't really know what would happen in the nearest felineless world, because we have no concept of what nearness act, nearest world actually is. It's sort of, makes a lot of metaphysical assumptions about what a close world is but i mean if we go back to the beginning of history and what would you have to tweak to make no cats <coughs> that's a different sort of argument between the metaphysical thing of just sort of like deleting them from our existence and i don't really know what that would mean either um so th this sort of uh this argument here is um it's either it's sensitivity is a fine-tuning argument and you can't use this sort of thing either way um, see, this two worlds except one has objective moral reality. You see, it's like, that's again, that's deleting something out of our metaphysics. One way or the adding or deleting, depending on your position. Um, it doesn't actually, I don't find it uh, very compelling one way or the other. So I don't find these arguments, uh, yeah, not compelling. Implausible coincidence. Again, looks like fine-tuning of a different stripe. The final argument at which we'll look is streets. This proves the most interesting case, I believe. Street argues that the evolutionary facts commit realists to an implausible coincidence. In some cases, she writes as if this coincidence is supposed to be that the beliefs favored by selection accurately resent, represent objective moral facts. Yes, it would be an amazing coincidence if we happened to evolve without moral facts and then it just happened that everything lined up perfectly. Thus, Street 2006 insists that the degree of overlap between the content of evaluative truth and the content of judgments that nat naturally select pushed us in the direction of making begs in the direction of making <laughs> in the direction of making begs for an explanation. The realist is supposed to be forced to count is supposed to be forced to count this overlap as merely coincidental given that moral facts are irrelevant in accounting for the selection process the selection pressures shaping human moral psychology stated in these terms her argument seems to fail in light of the points raised in this article we can dismiss the claim that our evolved moral beliefs can only be true by accident if we suppose that these beliefs are explained at the level of proximate causes in terms of corresponding moral facts same thing as above, as author says. If the value of reciprocity explains my valuing reciprocity and the boldness of pain explains why I believe pain is bad, then these beliefs are not merely coincidentally true, even if they have evolved as a result of truth in different selection pressures. Street may have a reply to this objection. She may suppose that we can reinstate the problem by locating the coincidence elsewhere. On this proposal, the implausible coincidence isn't that our evolved ethical beliefs overlap with the objective moral facts rather it is that beliefs that overlap with the objective moral facts have pr proven reproductively advantageous yes why should moral morality have anything to do with evolution going the other direction if we grant that the, the truth of these moral beliefs doesn't explain why they had increased the relative fitness of our ancestors we may try to argue that would have it would have to be a startling coincidence that these beliefs were reproductively advantageous and represent objective moral facts, even though there is no coincidence that they represent objective moral facts. It is not clear that the argument will be equally convincing stated in these terms. The original worry that our ethical beliefs could only be accurate as a matter of coincidence seems to tap into familiar concerns about epistemic luck seems prima facie plausible that I am not justified in believing P if I know that I could 
be right about P only as a matter of sheer coincidence. It is not so obvious why the coincidence described in the previous paragraph should represent a problematic commitment for the realist, that there is no general ban on believing in coincidences after all. Uh, yeah, but you don't really want to be hanging your philosophy on coincidences. Really, it would say, let's see, why, I mean, I think there's a much better thing to say right here. Uh, no. I mean, what I would say here is, look, maybe there are objective moral facts, and, we, and evolution has been fighting tooth and nail against them since the beginning of time. It's the reason for all of our difficulties in this world is that they're objective moral facts and evolution doesn't get along with them. That's why everything is so hard. And so the, uh, the fact that we've evolved to cope with them and that they are real is a very, like, that's the result. We've had to evolve in spite of moral facts, not because they lined up with evolutions, but because we had to fight against evolution, had to work very hard to make anything that lived in a very difficult world where there were these weird moral things out there fighting them. Okay, but whether the kind of coincidence to which realists remain committed is genuinely incredible turns ultimately on difficult and important questions about the nature and expectability of coincidences. The, these informations lie beyond the scope of this article. Suppose nonetheless that Street's argument turns out to be comparably convincing under the re reformulation described earlier and thus can't be ruled out as premised on a confusion of proximate and ultimate causes. Even so, our ability to convince, convict the arguments of Joyce and Roos on this count represent represents a significant result. This is especially true once we note the following important difference between these arguments. Street argues that meta-ethical constructivism should be accepted over realism in light of the facts in light of facts about evolution. Should be meta-ethical constructivism. I don't know what that is. Since the latter commits us to an incredible coincidence whereas the former does not. Our argument is not designed to debunk our first order ethical beliefs. By contrast, Joyce and Roos believe that evolutionary considerations support ethical skepticism. Roos wants us to concede that morality is a collective illusion foisted, up, foisted upon us by our genes. Joyce forthcoming makes clear that his argument for evolutionary moral skepticism is directed just as much against those who hold constructivist meta-ethical views as those holding realist views. Suppose then that streets is the only debunking argument still in the running, the only argument that doesn't rely on confusing proximate and ultimate expla confusion of proximate and ultimate explanatory factors. In that case, we should at least conclude that evolutionary considerations pose no significant challenge to our first order normative beliefs, much as they might impact our understanding of the metaphysical status of ethical facts. Okay, fine. Conclusion, I've argued that we can't infer that moral facts do not explain our moral beliefs <coughs> simply because beliefs of that kind have evolved as a result of truth in different selection pressures. Those who draw this conclusion are confusing proximate and ultimate causes. This observation rules out arguments for evolutionary skepticism to Ruse and Joyce. Street's Darwinian argument for meta-ethical constructivism may be capable of reformulated, of being reformulated so as to avoid this objection, though it's unclear that her argument remains equally convincing once the necessary revisions are made. Whether this this is so turns ultimately on the difficult question about nature and expected coincidences that will have to be answered in a different article. Yeah, um, not bad. Uh, I, like I said, this last bit I was rather uh, dubious about coincidences. It's, uh, I don't quite by the author's uh, account at that spot, but not bad. Um, the question, of course, is how much uh, weight can you put on the proximate ultimate distinction here? And uh, the fact that the target of this argument seems to fail hard on these this distinction makes it seem like the, the uh, Andreas L. Mogensen has a good point against uh, Roos and uh, Joyce, it looks like. Okay, so thanks for uh, watching if you're still here, and have a good day. Again, leave me a comment if you, if you so desire. Be safe.